Happy Sabbath. Once again, I want to welcome you to our series that we've been going through, Fight Club. And I believe that God has been too good and too awesome to us by keeping us alive. And I don't know how your week was, but however it was, I just want you to say praise the Lord. Can you just say right now, hallelujah to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah to the name of Jesus. I'm excited uh, because of this uh, series called Fight Club, because it's reminding me that God is a fighter. And I also want to encourage you to know God is a fighter. And so if we can embrace the concept that God fights for us, it doesn't really matter what we're going through, but that we're going to make it through if God is beside us. Uh, today, I have chosen our text of uh, sermonic expression from 1st Kings chapter 12 and verse number 20 to 24. Once again, 1 Kings chapter 12, verse number 20 to 24. And I want to read in your hearing. Uh, verse number 20 begins by saying, And all Israel had heard that Jeroboam had returned. They sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. And there was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Verse number 21 says, And when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled the house of Judah, all the house of Judah, and Benjamin, 180,000 warriors, chosen warriors. And he chose them uh, to fight against the house of Israel, check this, uh, to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of the Lord came to Shehemiah, the man of God. Say to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to all the rest, and to the rest of the people. This is what God asked Shehemiah to say. Listen to this verse. This is a key text uh, for this morning. Thus says the Lord. You shall not go up or fight against your relatives, the people of Israel. Every man return to his home, for this thing is from me. This thing is from me. And then he continues to say, so they listened to the word of the Lord. Every man went again to his home according to the word of the Lord. I have been inspired this morning to preach from this text uh, the idea when God says no to a fight. When God says no to a fight. Let us pray. Father, I need you to help me at this moment. Impact my thinking. Impact my vocal machine. And help me, Lord, to be able to relate to you in this moment. Teach me, O oh God, how to speak. And speak to my brother and sister. And inspire them too. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Have you ever lost something that you were certain you would never lose? I'm talking about you were 100% confident that you would not lose this thing. Uh, one day, uh, I had $10 in my pocket. This $10 was burning a hole in my pocket, and I needed to splurge on this $10. So I jumped into or went into a Walmart, and I walked into Walmart, and I went into the section where they were selling ramen noodles. This is the American version of Indomie. So I found me uh, on, on, the, on the aisle, there were uh, packets of ramen noodles. 
And there was a shrimp flavor. There was a beef flavor. There was chicken flavor. Uh, that day I was feeling a little chicken-ish. And so I picked the chicken flavor uh, from the aisle. It was a pack of 24 uh, noodle packs. So I, I took this pack in my hand. I didn't even use a cart. I just held it in my hand. It was dear to me because I, was, I started to imagine already what Sunday afternoon would be like. I would have a bowl of ramen noodles. I would have two kilograms of chicken wings from Walmart. And then I would have an orange Fanta from Walmart. And then, and then I'll be watching a, a, a football game from the NFL. So as I'm walking, I'm imagining my dreams that are going to become reality. Just I need to clear uh, the, the clerk. I, I need to, keep, to clear the, the cashier. And so I got there. I placed my, my noodles on the, on the checkout counter. And the cashier rang my bill to a whopping $9.50. Uh, now, you know, when you got money, you feel good. And somebody tells you a price and you know you got the money, it's, it's no problem, it's, it's, it's nothing. And so I, 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 I stuck my hand into my pocket and I dag around my pocket. I didn't feel cash, I felt cloth. I didn't feel cash, I felt my pocket cloth. And I realized that the $10 that I was 100% sure that I would not lose, I had lost. And for the life of me, I retraced my steps back to the uh, aisle where I picked up the ramen noodles. There was no $10 in, from the cashier to the aisle. I said, let me go back to the car. And I went back to the car. I could not find the $10 uh, to the point that I went back to the cashier. And I said, look, I don't know what I did. I don't know uh, what happened to me, but I've lost my $10. Have you ever lost something that you were sure that you never lose? Have you ever lost that thing that you said, you know what, this, I, I cannot lose it. It's dear to me no matter what. But when you check your wallet, the money is not there. When you check your pocket, the key is not there. When you check your bag, you don't find that access card. When you check your belongings, you do not find what you are looking for. And sometimes it is frustrating. It is difficult. It is challenging. But you have lost lost it and it is lost forever. Somebody said that in the course of our lifetime, we're going to lose at least 200,000 items. And if you think about that, it means that every day on average, many of us are losing at least nine things. Rehoboam loses something that he shouldn't have lost. He loses the kingdom that God had given to his father. God had united 12 kingdoms, 12 tribes into one. And his granddaddy David had ruled over these 12 kingdoms. His father Solomon had ruled over these 12 kingdoms. And he felt, he understood, he thought, I would never lose these 12 kingdoms. There is no way that I'm going to lose 50% of my land. There is no way I'm going to lose my revenue. There is no way that I'm going to lose taxes and income. There is no way that I'm going to reduce the size of my army. There is no way that I'm going to lose servants serving me. There is no way that I'm going to allow this kingdom to be divided. But the truth of the matter is, according to the text, Rehoboam lost the kingdom. Rehoboam lost something that he thought he would have never lost. And I want to take you through a journey from what he had to the point of where he lost what he had. You see, the sun had set on the rule of Solomon. And the sun had risen on the rule of Rehoboam, his son. This was a critical moment because there was a transfer of power from one king to another king. From a king that had been on the throne for 41 years to a young man who had never sat on the throne but he was 41 years of age. 
And so a group of representatives from every tribe of Israel gathered in a place we called Shechem. We call Shechem. For those of you who listened to me preach on the, on the sermon uh, in our last series called Keep Moving, I talked about Shechem. You remember Shechem where uh, Jacob tried to settle down but God said you got to keep moving? Yeah, they gathered at this place called Shechem. And there they gathered all the 12 tribes. The text says all of Israel, but it wasn't all of Israel. It was the representatives of Israel. And they were there for the sole purpose of coronation of their new king, Rehoboam. Rehoboam got there in Shechem and he knelt down. And a prophet of God came over Rehoboam and poured oil on his head. And Rehoboam could feel the oil running down his head, and on, his, on his forehead, to his eyes. It dripped down oh, beside his nose. It touched his lips and it, it went on his beard. And Rehoboam could feel the prophet of God take the crown and place it on his head. And then the same prophet told the king, King, there is your throne. Can you please sit down? And there Rehoboam, he sat down on his throne, the new king of Israel. And there the 12 representatives from all the tribes of Israel, they said the words of declaration and affirmation and clarification. They tell Rehoboam, Rehoboam, all king, live forever. And Rehoboam knew that he was king of Israel. One of the representatives there that day, uh, several of them, they, they petitioned the king. And they said, uh, king, we... We are we're happy that you are the new king over Israel. We, we, we are glad that you are going to be reigning over us. And it's a beautiful thing. And, and as you know, we have just coronated you. We have advanced your mission, your purpose, the relationship that we have had with your father and your grandfather. We want to continue the relationship, king. Uh, however, we would like to ask you of a small policy change. Uh, when your father was king, King Solomon the Great, he had a, he had a difficult uh, requirement and responsibility for us. He put a heavy yoke on our backs and uh, a heavy burden. And we would like to ask you, king, to please reduce this burden. Uh, the people of... Israel, the 12 representatives, they petitioned the king a legitimate concern. Now you see, we, we, we like to hear about the greatness of Solomon. He, he was a great king. He was an amazing king. And he, he led the nation of Israel in one of his most prosperous reigns. But what gets buried in the life and the story of Solomon is that it took a lot of resources to bankroll his uh, operation. Uh, just to help you to see that if Solomon or for Solomon to eat <laughs> one day, one day's provision for Solomon, it required, listen to this, it required 65 kilograms of flour. It required a hundred sheep to be slaughtered. It required 30 cows to be slaughtered, and that's excluding gazelles and roebucks and fattened fowl. And Solomon got all of his resources every day from the people that were serving him. And Solomon did not have to expend a single penny for anything that he got. And so the people are saying uh, to Rehoboam, Rehoboam, look, uh, you see, the king has been splurging on us. And though we are interested in serving him and continuing this relationship, uh, we believe and we think that you need to change the situation. And, and by the way, it is unfair that all of us are pitching in, but your house doesn't pitch in. And also, the tribe of Judah does not pitch in. I mean, how do you feel if you are making all of the effort at work, but your friend gets the promotion? 
How would you feel that you are the one who is taking out the trash out of your house, but your parents only recommend your brother who never takes out the trash? Here was an unfair situation that the people desired King Solomon to address for them. Now, what I love about this situation is that they understood a fundamental component. If a relationship is to function carefully, ah, please listen to me right now. I'm giving you something that is going to help you. If a relationship is to function properly, there cannot be one side of the relationship experiencing the fair share, the, the great benefit, the great credit, where, where the other side of the relationship is not getting the same benefit. The people of Israel say, King, you are enjoying so many things, but we are not enjoying the same advantages. And we think that that is an unfair situation. If you want to enjoy a good working relationship, if you want to enjoy a good marital relationship, if you want to, to enjoy a good friendship, if you want to, to enjoy a good connection, you need to make sure that you bring to the table your part and that the other part brings to the table their part. There cannot be an imbalance. There cannot be a situation where one is enjoying all of the good things and the other one is simply putting in all the work without getting the credit. You understand what I'm saying? And I believe that some of us are in a situation like that, whether it be at work, whether it be in our home circles, whether it be in our friendships, we are pulling all of the load. We are pulling, uh, we, are we are putting in all of the work and sometimes that is disturbing and it is not good. And so here the 12 representatives say to the king, king, uh, it, it's got to change. Uh, and what I love about this petition is that it was a petition uh, intended, intended, and I want to use that word again, it was intended uh, to ensure uh, that the relationship would continue. Notice that the people coronated Rehoboam as king. Notice that they were intending to serve him. But after serving, uh, showing their intentions, putting their cards on the table, then they brought up the petition. Oh, let me help you. If you want to work on the issues that you have in your relationships, and by the way, I'm not just talking about love relationships here. I'm talking about relationships all across the board. If you want to work on any relationship that has a problem like this, you need to show your intention that you want the relationship to continue, but your concern is to ensure that the relationship is benefited. It is to intend that the relationship enjoys a greater sense of equality. You know how it is. When the police want to arrest somebody, they will tell the person, hands up. You know why? They want to ensure that the person they're about to arrest is not intending to attack them. And so when the people coronated Jerobo Rehoboam as king, it's as if they put their hands up. They're saying, King, we're not intending to attack. We're intending to attach. <laughs> we're intending not to detach from you. We're intending to be closer to you. And so the people, I believe, they made a wise, calculated decision. And if you can do the same thing in your relationships, attack them from a point where the person does not see you as a threat, but sees you as somebody who can be a benefit, then you're going to see your relationship benefit fit. <laughs> My brother and sister, sometimes we are aggrieved and I understand. Sometimes the boss is not treating us correctly. Sometimes somebody is not treating you as they should be treating you. And I understand all of that. But I believe that here we have a wisdom point that we can take. Some people have been telling me about wisdom all the time. We need to approach the relationships wisely. And if we can do like the people did, I believe that you're going to see your relationships improve because when somebody sees that you're not a threat, then they are more willing and, and likely to listen to you and hear your concern. The people petitioned for the king to change the policy and Rehoboam decided to petition as well to be given three days to deliberate and to consider the situation. He tells, okay, I have heard what you are telling me. Uh, allow me to uh, think about this, and in three days I will give you an answer. 
So Rehoboam, uh, in a move that I think is a wise move, he decides to go and consult uh, the people that had already been serving his father. You see, these people who had been serving his father had seen how his, the rule of Solomon had been. Yes, it was a great moment of Israel's history. In fact, nobody lacked. You know, in the time of Solomon, there was no unemployment. Every person ate from their own pocket. They didn't need to go beg on the street. It was that good. But in order to achieve that, Solomon required a lot of from the people. And so the people could, uh, the, these, these wise men that Rehoboam went to, uh, read the temperature of the situation. They realized, you know, <laughs> the people want things to change. And so Rehoboam was smart to consider those who had gray hairs. Listen to what I'm saying. He was smart to consider the people that had, had experienced. They, they had lived on this planet. They had already seen and gone through many different things. And so Rehoboam went to these people and he comes to these people. They had retired officially from uh, serving the king. But he went to them and he says, uh, listen, man, I need your wisdom. I have been to Shechem and I've spoken to the representatives there and they have told me that they would like me to reduce the policy of my father. Now, I want to ask you, what do you advise me that I can give answer to these people that are asking me to reduce my father's uh, policy or to change? So they told him something that uh, was... Interesting, and I want you to catch this. They say, listen, uh, Rehoboam, I think that the people are, are correct because, you know, things have, have been good, but it also hasn't been good. It's been tough. And I, I think, King, you will be wise to be a servant for a day so that you can be a king for the rest of your days. A king, it will be wise if you can put aside your ego so that the people can draw beside you, so that for the rest of the days they're going to be beside you. A king, it's okay for a day to put aside your pride so that people will have pride in you. King, I think you have a great opportunity to change the tide of the situation. Right now, things are very tense. And if you decide to go in this direction, king, I think things are going to be good for you. But you know, Rehoboam listened to that and he says, you know, I'm the king. I mean, I'm the king. They're the servants. Who are they to tell me how I should run things? I mean, nobody ever came to my father and told him how to do things. Nobody ever told David how to do things. Who are these people to think that they can tell me or what to do? And so Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the gray head. Rehoboam forsook the counsel of those who had experienced. Rehoboam forsook the counsel of those who had already lived more years than he had lived. And he went and he talked to his buddies. The Hebrew is very interesting. It says Rehoboam talked to the people that had grown up with him. In fact, in the Hebrew, it uses the word gadol. Gadol is a, is a term which means to be great. Now, when you are aging, Parents, when your kids are aging from one to two to three, that is gadol. When you are becoming and uh, moving from teenage uh, to young adult uh, to, uh, to, to an older young adult, and then you become an adult, and then you become an old man, we call that gadol. You, you are progressing and becoming greater in your age. Notice that they were becoming greater in their age, but uh, not really in experience. So Rehoboam goes to these guys who are becoming great in age with him. He had grown up with him. These are the buddies that he used to play uh, uh, with when he was coming up. These are the buddies that he used to go out and hang out with. These are the buddies that he used to go watch movies with. These are the buddies that he used to play video games with. And he goes to these buddies and he says to his buddies, listen, our friends, look, look, look. Uh, you know, the people in Shechem up there, they're asking me to reduce things. And, and, and I went to the old man and, man, you know, those, those old fellas, I mean, look, they are like the baby boomers. We, we are Generation Z, you know what I mean? We are millennials and, you know, they don't understand how things are supposed to happen. And look, they gave me advice that I should be 
a servant for a day so that I can be a king for a lifetime. But, 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 but I want to hear from you guys. Like I'm still thinking about this situation and I would like to hear what you guys think about this and let me know what it should be and how I should do this. So one of the fellas, he says to Rehoboam, yeah, Re Rehoboam, uh, listen, man, um, the way I see it, the way I feel it is that if you, <clears throat> if you give these people an inch, <laughs> if you give them an inch, they will want a foot. And if you give them a foot, they will want an acre. And if you give them an acre, they will want a, he a hectare. Uh, so I, I think King, I mean, bro, you know what I mean? They didn't even call him king. They're like, yo, bro, I think, man, look, uh, I'm for, uh, for you to smack these people with law and order. Like, like tell them that, look, we're going to be strict about situation. I mean, they need to respect you like Solomon, your dad. They need to respect you like, like, like David. Don't allow them to disrespect you right now. Because if you let them slide you right now, they're going to be sliding you at every turn. They're not going to listen to you. So you need to tell them that, look. This is what you need to say. In fact, man, I'm going to write to you the speech that you need to speak. You need to say to them, my little finger is going to be thicker than my father's loins. Whereas my father uh, whipped you with whips, I'm going to whip you with scorpions. King, that's what you need to say. And so after three days, the people came to hear from their king what he thought about their petition. And the king says, st stands up, he says, uh, listen here. I want you to hear me carefully and clearly. I'm the king. You are my servants. And there is no way, there is no way that I'm going to allow you to run me. And I want you to understand that what I'm going to do is that I'm going to make it harder for you than it was when my father was king. I'm going to make it more difficult than you have ever been because I think that you got it twisted. You think I'm young? You think I don't have experience? And so here I'm, I'm here to teach you, oh, how foolish he was. Oh, how foolish he was. He failed to listen to people that were wise. He chose to listen to people that were young and inexperienced. And because he did this, the Bible says, the people looked at each other. They said, did you hear this guy? Did you just hear what he said? Man, you see to your own house, David. We are not going to be a part of you no more. We are going to do our own thing. We are no longer one nation. We are no longer one people. You are your own. We are on our own. And so because of Rehoboam's selfishness, because Rehoboam did not choose to serve the people, he allowed what was his to be lost. You see, my brother and sister, I'm here to tell you the truth, and here's the truth of the matter. When you choose the way of self-service, you're always going to do yourself a disservice. You're always going to lose what was supposed to be yours in the first place. I am reminded of many gas stations in parts of the world where uh, when you are about to fill up your car, uh, you can fill your car by yourself. It's called self-service. But what is interesting is this. When you, when you self-serve yourself at the gasoline station, you got to give out of your resources, even though you have served yourself. Do I, do, I, do I have a witness? What I'm saying is this. When you serve yourself, there is always something that you're going to lose. There is always something that is going to go away from you. You cannot serve yourself. And do yourself a great service. When you serve yourself, you're doing yourself a great disservice. You hear, here was a simple recommendation by the old man. Rehoboam, be a servant today. Put your pride down today. Put your ego aside today. And if you can do that, the people are going to serve you. But too many of us, we, we are like Rehoboam, too proud to listen, uh, too hard-hearted to listen. We think we are right. We think the situation is okay, and we can do whatever we want to do, my way or the highway. But my brother and sister, hear me carefully. You are going to lose something precious when you choose the way of self-service. And here, the sad thing of it is, Rehoboam destroyed himself. Rehoboam destroyed 50% of his territory. Rehoboam destroyed 
50% of his revenue. Rehoboam destroyed 50% of his army personnel. Rehoboam destroyed 50% of his influence. Rehoboam destroyed 50% of what he had. Brother and sister, hear me carefully. If you choose the way of self-service, you are going to destroy 50% of something. 50% of your love. 50% of your income. 50% of your family's affection. 50% of your influence. Because there is something I want you to understand. That the world has been created in a great symbiotic relationship when the rain comes down from the the sky it hits the ground it goes into the river it goes into the ocean and it goes back again because of the world is meant to continue to serve each other and i want to encourage you brother and sister we need to develop a state of a symbiosis what i do is not only for me what i do benefits my family benefits my friends benefits the church and so when we function from a symbiotic selfless perspective then we do ourselves a great service here is a man that lost what was in his hands because he thought man oh man I'm the king who are they to tell me how to do things who are they to tell me how to run things you see Rehoboam's story doesn't need to be our story The name Rehoboam, it means to enlarge. Specifically to enlarge the people. Rehoboam was not enlarging the people. He was constricting the people. Instead of allowing them to be free from paying such a heavy tax, uh, from paying such a heavy resource, he decided to constrict them more. And I'm sure some of those fathers were there thinking about their kids. I I need to save, put aside some money so that when I die, my kids are going to have something to fall back on. But I keep giving it to the king. Perhaps some of those were thinking, I always give my grapes and my wine to the king. Can I have something for me? Perhaps some of those were thinking, I have been giving my daughters and my sons to serve in the court of the king. Some of them are servants, some of them are his up. Can I have my kids to be here with me right here so that I can enjoy, I can enjoy, I can enjoy them and be with them? Rehoboam was constricting the people. He was restricting the people. I believe that he put them in the jail cell of restriction. And sometimes we are in a position to bless people, to, to allow them to be elevated in their in their in their career we are in a position where we can give somebody a scholarship we're in a position where we can allow somebody to start exploring their gifts we're in a position where we can do something for somebody but because it doesn't serve us it doesn't benefit us then we still constrict the people and say no whatever you do is supposed to serve me and here Rehoboam learns the hard way that because of self-service I did myself a great disservice Rehoboam did not think that the people were serious. In fact, he felt that they were joking. How can the 12, the 10 tribes decide to demarcate themselves from from the kingdom of David and, and Solomon? Uh, you know, there are some people who make empty threats. They say, I want us to break up. Then we tell them, let's break up. They're like, I was just joking. Uh, some people say, I, I want to quit this job. But we say, you want to quit? Uh, I was just joking. Uh, they, they, there are some people who do that. But these people were not making no empty threat. They, they were serious. So Rehoboam decided to test them. And he, he said he goes with Adoram, who was in charge of the labor force to go and collect uh, from the people uh, money because it was a collection every month. And when Adoram comes to the assembly and he says, I'm here to collect taxes, he was rained on with stones. And Rehoboam says, hey, (laughs) my man, this brother is about to die. They're going to kill me as well. The text says Rehoboam jumped into the 
into his chariot and he made his way to Jerusalem. Now when he gets to Jerusalem, Rehoboam is furious because he's thinking to himself, man, these brothers are really serious. They almost killed me. They almost took my life. That is an offense that a king cannot allow to be passed by. As a king, I need to show them that uh, that cannot happen. So Rehoboam, in verse 20, we read, it says, And when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and Benjamin, a hundred and eighty, a hundred and eighty thousand chosen warriors for the purpose of fighting the house of Israel to restore the kingdom to himself. Rehoboam says, I have to fight for what I have lost. You know how it is sometimes you, you have been on a roll. Maybe you have been reading your book every week. You know, it's been going on for like maybe two, three weeks. But then you become a little lazy and then you, 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 you get off your consistent reading. And then maybe a week or two passes by and then you tell yourself, hey, look, look, I, I was reading my book and, and I, I kind of want to go back to it. And so, you know what you do? You, you start to fight. You say, you know what? I need to make sure that I, st- I get, get, get back to my routine, right? I start going back to sleep early again. Let, let me make sure that I'm reading uh, at five in the morning. So you fight for that routine. And so here Rehoboam says, hey, man, I, I've let something slip. Let me go and fight for it. But now here's something that amazed me. Rehoboam lost the kingdom because of his harsh and forceful words. Now he's trying to reclaim the kingdom, what he has lost, Based on force. He's, he, instead of saying, you know what, let me get a delegation. Let me go to each tribal leader. Talk to them. Let's talk it out. And, you know, I, I, listen, I've had a, a change of heart. I realize that I made a mistake in what I said to you guys. I'm willing to accede and consent to your, to your, your, to your petition. I'm going to make it lighter. In fact, I'm going to do away with it. Instead of doing that, Jeroboam, Rehoboam decides to fight the people. He says, you know what? Yeah, no, nah, I got to fight these people. But when the soldiers are getting ready to fight, when they are putting their swords in their sheaths, when they are putting their uh, battle armor on and, and they're getting ready to fight, the Bible says a man of God, Shemaiah, the, 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 the word, the name meaning God has heard. God had heard the plan to fight against the Israelites. If this man comes and God tells him to deliver a message. And this is the message. You shall not go up or fight against your relatives, the people of Israel. This brother was about to fight. But God says, it is not all right to fight. I need you to understand that God does not allow us to fight every fight. Not every fight is a right to fight. Not every fight in your sight should you fight. Not every argument should you argue in. Not every jest, not every uh, terrible remark should you reply in. There, it is okay sometimes to be slighted. It is okay sometimes to be joked on, to be joked on and you don't say anything. It's okay to Turn the other cheek. Yes, I said it. It's okay to do that, especially when you know God has said, don't fight. So God says, tell, Shem, uh, tell, tell, tell Rehoboam, do not fight. God said no uh, to the fight. Now, 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 Rehoboam had reasons to fight. You know, he, 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 he said, you know, First of all, if I fight, I will restore my military might. If I fight, I will make sure that this kingdom is united. I mean, after all, it was God who gave us this kingdom. And these Israelites, uh, these other people, they want to destroy what God has put together. And so, no, I need to go fight. But God said no to the fight. And yes, you might have a reason to fight. You may not have been the one who started the fight. You are not the one who started the joke. You're not the one who wrote that comment on Instagram. You're not the one who started that argument. You're not the one who made the mistake. And yes, you might say, you know what? I need to show him today what I'm about. You may be like, you know what? My sister, she's putting it to me. And she got to hear from me. You know what? I want to show my parents what's up. How can they be restricting me for what I want to do? You might be in the right. I want to... 
take this course. I, I, I want to start this uh, business. You might be in the right and, and you might say, yeah, it is within my right. I'm, after all, I'm educated correctly. After all, I'm old enough. After all, I should be able to live on my own. You may have every right to fight the fight, but it still may not be a fight that you need to fight. God might tell you, uh-uh, eh, eh, let's not fight. So God tells Rehoboam, mm-mm, let's not fight. This is not your fight. You know, you've heard of Mike Tyson. He's, a, he's known as a great fighter. But people say that in his time, there was a greater fighter. His name, Tim Witherspoon. They say he was a much greater fighter than Mike Tyson. But you know, you have never heard Mike Tyson fight Tim with a spoon. You know why? Because Don King said no. Now, Don King was a manager of Mike Tyson. And the reason why he never allowed Mike Tyson to fight Tim Witherspoon is because he realized that the fight would never generate as much income for Mike Tyson. He realized that the fight would probably injure Mike Tyson and end his career early. And so in his wisdom, Don King says, I need to protect my fighter. <laughs> I'm coming. I need to protect my fighter. I need to make sure that I take care of his interest because he may be wanting to fight. He's a fighter. He's trained to fight. He may say, you know what, Don King, let me get in the fight. I can, I can knock him out. You know, I'm the knockout king. But Don King realized that the knockout king can also be knocked out. So he kept him away from the fight because he was thinking about his benefit. Hear me and hear me. When God keeps you away from the fight, it is because of your benefit. God can see that if you fight in this fight, there's going to be something that's going to be a negative impact on you. And so God could see that if I allow Rehoboam to fight, there's going to be a problem for Reho Rehoboam. Brother and sister, hear me carefully. This is a gospel coming to you. Yes, you may feel right to to fight but God is always right God is always right and this is the thing I need you to understand I'm talking about fight club when you are in the fight club of God you allow God to be your darn king you allow God to be able to set the fight that you need to fight you don't say God I have prayed enough God I have read the Bible enough God I am good let me fight the devil let me, let me do it nah. let God be the one to make your matches let God be the one to make your fights let God be the one to make your argumentation let God be the one to help you with your petitions whatever issues you have you need to be able to say lord i'm struggling at work i'm struggling in my house i'm struggling with this and that person how do i need to fight should i fight should i get involved lord is it your will uh-huh is it your wish is it your way i i see here uh, two reasons why god says do not fight rehoboam because god saw the casualties in the fight you see, God says to Rehoboam, do not fight against your relatives, the people of Israel. God was thinking about the people factor. He realized that if they fight, people are going to die. And you need to understand that every fight comes with casualties. Every fight comes with loss. Every fight will cost you something. In our silent fight against COVID-19, Indonesia has already lost over 2,000 people. Worldwide, the number is 490,000. Because every fight will always cost you casualties. And God realized that I'm going to lose 10 tribes. People are going to die. They're going to be sliced and, and diced. For what? So that Rehoboam can have the kingdom? <laughs> So that this selfish king can be king over all this kingdom. It was not a good enough reason to send soldiers to fight. And so God says no. The casualty cost is going to be too great. This is a useless fight. It is not an important fight. And some of us were fighting 
Useless fights, import, non-important fights. Hey, who cares what side of the bed you sleep on? Who cares who has the remote? Who cares who took out the the trash at first? Who cares which side of the, uh, the, the the which side the toilet paper rolls? Who cares what shoes you wear? You know, sometimes we fight, bro. I I can only rock these shoes. You cannot rock this. Who cares about that? Those are useless fights. And here's the thing, brother and sister. So when you're about to fight, the question should be, what is the casualty cost? What am I going to lose because of this fight? What am I going to part with because of this fight? When you start to think like that and you realize, is it really worth it for me to lose my job? Is it really worth it for me to lose this friendship? Is it worth it for me to lose this uh, relationship? Is it worth it for me to lose this influence? Is it worth it for me to lose my health? Is it worth it for me to lose my wealth? Is it worth it to you for me to lose my strength? Is it worth it for me to lose my, my peace? Is it worth it for me to lose my my sense of calm is it worth it to lose any of this if you can ask yourself this question before you fight then you might realize my goodness this is not really a fight that I need to fight and that's what fight club is all about it's about fighting smartly oh my goodness it's about realizing that I need to use my energy the right way and be ready at the right way and when you can do that brother and sister you will make sure that every fight will mean something every fight will accomplish something don't get it twisted though God will ask us to fight sometimes yeah Jesus even said that don't think I've come to send peace on the earth. I've come to send a sword. So sometimes, yes, a fight is necessary. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, sometimes the cost of not fighting is greater than the cost. I mean, the cost of, of not fighting is greater than the cost of a fighting. But here I'm here to tell you that, nah, check yourself before you fight. Is this a really important fight? Is this worth it? Oh, is this a useless fight? And one of the ways you know that is counting the casualty cost. Who's going to lose in this fight? Is my church going to lose in this fight? Are my kids going to lose in this fight? Is my business going to suffer in this fight? Is my relationship going to suffer in this fight? Who is the casualty? Because sometimes, as the saying goes, when two elephants fight, the grass always suffers. Think about the grass. Who is the grass? And when you can think about the grass, then you realize, mm, let me apply a little grace. Let me not fight. But if you know that the grass needs the fight, then yeah, get in the fight. There's another reason why God tells Rehoboam not to fight. And that's the cause of the fight. God tells Rehoboam, every man return to his home, for this thing is from me. <laughs> this fight that you have with Israel, the fact that you are divided, the fact that you want to go fight them is me. I, I'm the one who has made it happen. Wait a minute, Lord. You are not the one who spoke harshly to the Israelites. You, 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 you were not Rehoboam who spoke, who spoke uh, out of proud, pride. How did you make it happen? Uh, let me bring it to you. God utilized the decision of Rehoboam to accomplish his purpose. In God's sovereign will, his purpose can never be stopped. I believe God never restricts our choices. But we can never constrict his will. Let me put it in a way that you can understand and relate to what I'm saying. Right now, the sun is beating on us here in Indonesia. If you go outside and you stand on the street, you're going to feel the heat of the sun. But the sun is not shining in the other part of the world. Because that's how it works. If the sun is shining here, it is not shining over there. If it is not shining 
uh, here it is shining over there. So right now the sun is shining here. But we know that at around 6 p.m. this evening, the sun will stop shining here and it will start shining over there. That is how God will works. That it doesn't matter the situation, but eventually his will is going to be made manifest. And so here, though Rehoboam made a terrible choice, yet it was still a part of God's purpose and God's plan. And so God is telling Rehoboam, Rehoboam, you are, you are foolish. You, you made a bad mistake. But this mistake is what I'm going to use to benefit you. Brother and sister, hear me carefully. You might make mistakes. You might blunder. You might do things that are not good. But hear me today. God can use what is not good for his good to help you and benefit you. God can bless your mistake and, and, and change the curse into a blessing. And I want you to see what I'm trying to tell you right here. God could see that the ten tribes will lose their way. And the Assyrians are going to take them away forever to be erased from history. But God could see the tribe of Judah, the, the throne of David, is where the Messiah is going to come from from it is where Jesus will be born from and so while God had to part with twin tribes he was not willing to part with the tribe of Judah because God could see in the future that Jesus needs to be born to benefit Rehoboam brother and sister hear me today you may lose things it may be painful you may fight hard for them but if God decrees that you need to lose it, don't fight for it. If God thinks the relationship should go, let it go. If the job should go, let the job go. If the house should go, let the house go. If the car should go, let it go. If the shoes got to go, let it go. If the phone got to go, let it go. Whatever God says, let go. You got to let it go. Sometimes we are fighting to get a job back. You have done everything that you could. You have talked to your boss. And the boss has told you, we'll let you know if we have an opening. You have talked to your co-workers, do you, who you used to work with. You have told them, listen, if the boss says that there's an opening, please let me know. They never come back to you. You have gone there and looked on the, on the website, looking for that a notification we are hiring, but it never comes. You have prayed about it. You have fasted about it. You have sought advice about it, but the job doesn't come back. I'm here to tell you that it could be God's way of saying, it is lost. It cannot come back. Let it go go and you should be okay with that because in the grand scheme of things in God's great purpose and God's great will you will realize that it is a benefit in the first place you may not know it today but someday you realize that what you lost was really a benefit and a blessing in the first place uh, you see the people the 12 representatives they complained to Rehoboam uh, petition him for a social concern. They, they were worried about the, the social structure and the political e economic situation. But there is something that I didn't tell you that I need to tell you now. When Solomon was king, he introduced a different kind of worship. And what this worship did is that it changed the, the spiritual nature of Israel. Instead of them only having one God, they start having two, three, four gods. And so if the people were really legitimate in their complaint, they would have said to Rehoboam, Rehoboam, do not only change the burden of your father in terms of our financial political resources, but make sure that you change also the spiritual influence of your father. If they really cared, they would have talked about everything. But how that sometimes it is that people are so selfish simply about themselves, they're not willing to benefit us. And so God is telling Rehoboam, Rehoboam, you don't need those 10 tribes. Let them go. They're not going to benefit you because they're only concerned about them. So brother and sister, hear me today that when you lose something, it might be precious. You might like it. Yes, it may be good. But in God's eyes, if it's gone and you're fighting to get it back, it doesn't come back. In God's eyes, it's like, yo, that's God's will. Let me accept it and move on. I'm not going to fight for it. Because you see, you can fight. You can fight. But you're not going to succeed. 
Because if God has said no, my brother and sister, you, you will go down to the grave fighting. It ain't going to come back. And these people are fighting for something God says, you need to let go. Rehoboam learned the hard way. I made a poor choice and I lost it. And God helped him to understand that being king is not a right. It is a privilege. Your father, Solomon, did not realize the privilege that he had. And because he didn't show his loyalty, I needed to show my authority by taking away the kingdom from you. And that's the lesson you and me need to understand. Everything that God gives us is a privilege. It's not because you're so smart, that's why you got that degree. It's not so smart that uh, you, you're living today. It's not because of a diet plan that you, you, you're healthy. Everything we have that is good comes from God. And when we make what we have more important than God, God has to check us and say, you know what? Mm, let this thing go. And when he has told us, let it go, let's not fight for it anymore. Let's let it go. We need to be like kids who their parents tell them, look, I'm not going to buy this for you now. Never just stop it. And we should be like, okay, mommy, dad, I'm, I'm going to accept it and move on. I had to learn the hard way that some things, when they are gone, they are gone. Do not fight for them. I was working for a friend of my dad, and, and one day we were working on a, a cupboard. And uh, it was a drawer, and, and it was, we, we spent the whole day working on this, sanding it nicely and, and putting it. It was, a, it, was, it was for a very important customer, and it was very expensive. So the, the guy I was working for tells me, uh, listen, Henry, I want to go down the street. I, wanna, I want to buy us uh, uh, Dr. Pepper and, and something to eat. Just, just chill right here. Uh, I'll be right back. But please don't touch anything. But me, a little curious me, I decided to take the electronic sander and I started to, to kind of sand. I wanted to practice my sanding skills on that expensive piece of furniture. And in my foolishness, I, I was sanding on the edge and then I, I didn't handle the sander well and it, it, it put a little dip on the edge. And so to, let, to, to try to smoothen out the little ditch on the, on the edge, I was sanding even more. And the more I sanded it down, the more I was making the situation worse. And so I decided to stop it and just chilled like he told me in the first place. So he came back. We drank uh, Dr. Pepper. I mean, and we were good. We ate. He dropped me home. And in this way, his words <laughs> to me, I'm going to call you. He never called. Until this day, he's never called. And I lost a job because of a choice that I made. And no matter how hard my dad even tried to talk to him, like, hey, my son made a mistake. Or he says, listen, I, I was testing your son to see if you'd actually, this is what my dad told me. I, I was, te I was texting, testing your son to see if you'd actually obey instructions, but he didn't. So I cannot work with a person like that. So I had, I had to accept that and, and live with that. Uh, but, but I believe that that was a lesson, an important lesson to me that God needed to give me. And so, brother and sister, I don't know what you have lost. I don't know what you are, you are clamoring for, for. But look, what is the thing that God is trying to give you? And if you can realize that, oh, my goodness, God is trying to teach me something. In your moment of loss, you realize that God is actually trying to benefit me. And instead of fighting to get it back, you're going to say, you know what? It's all right, Lord. I accept it. And I'm going to move on and I love the way the text ends it says so they listened to the word of the Lord every man went home again according to the word of the Lord Rehoboam said you know what yeah God it's cool I'm not gonna fight besides if, if a prophet told tells you that don't fight it simply means that God is not going to be involved in it so Rehoboam understood hey if I go fight I'm gonna lose this fight so let me let me not fight so he, he doesn't go fight but he accepts God's will for him at that particular moment. You see, in Fight Club, when you're fighting with God, for God, beside God, is to learn to submit to God. It's to live your life for God. It's to know that some things are not as important. Some things are not that big. I can let them go. And so this is the question I want to pose to you today. Are you willing to say, you know what, Lord, I'm going to follow your way. Lord, you know what, I'm going to do what you're telling me to do. I'm not going to fight no more. I'm going to give up. 
I'm, I'm, I'm not going to keep striving for something that I should have been striving for. Today I want to say, you know what, I've realized, yeah, uh, there are casualties in, fight, in a fight. I don't want to lose uh, certain things that I shouldn't lose. You, today I've realized, well, the, the, some things God causes them to happen. Okay, Lord, I realize that. Okay, you caused this to happen. It's cool. I accept it. And today I say, Lord, I accept you. I accept your purpose. And I want to live for you. Lord, today I will, uh, I will not fight the fights you say no to. To. Today, Lord, if you tell me don't do it, I ain't going to do it. If you say don't go, I ain't going to go. If you tell me don't run, I ain't going to run. If you tell me don't jump, I ain't going to jump. If you tell me don't say, I ain't going to say, Lord, I will fight based upon your direction. I will fight based upon your leading. I am yours. You are mine. We are together in this. COVID-19 is not going to beat me up because you are going to direct me in how I should fight. Hallelujah, somebody. And I want to stand here today and tell you, I want to fight with God. I want to fight according to God's strategy. I don't want to fight useless fights. I don't want to fight needless fights. And I want to stand with God. I want to stand with Rehoboam and say, you know what, Lord? I will go back to my crib. I will go back to my house. I will rest at my home. I'm not going to fight no more. I will let you dictate for me what I should do. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. We realize that some fights are unnecessary. We shouldn't fight them. And today, Lord, we want to pray and commit that we're not going to fight useless, needless fight. Today, we want to pray and commit. We are, gonna say, we are not going to say yes when you have said no. We are not going to fight your no's. And Lord, we want to pray that you rescue us from the need to be proud from the need to always fight. We want to pray that you rescue us from being these people who are always argumentative and always assertive, but help us to be people who are directed by you and guided by you. Father, after all, when you tell us no, it is for our benefit and for that we accept it. I want you to pray. I want to pray that you bless my brother and my sister and help them to experience your grace and your power. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Amen.